Narrative. Hey everybody, welcome to Forward's Narrative. My name is Paul Murphy, your host for the Alabella Lost Souls podcast. I'm joined tonight by Val Heffelfinger. Paul Murphy! Val, the East Coast is plagued by blizzards and storms, general apocalypse. They just call that living in Canada, where I'm from. <laughs> the West Coast, where Morgan is, apparently plagued by plagues. Actual plagues? Well, for him it is. Oh... Yeah. Yeah, there's been some bad stuff going on. All right, by the way, is Atlanta shut down right now? Is this what you're trying to tell okay, me? Okay, there may be one snowflake. If there's a snowflake in the morning, we'll be shut down. <laughs> Thank you all for everyone in the world humoring us, especially those in Europe and other, other places. For But you know, we, we're not kidding. It's just you and I tonight. It, it, it's, it's, it's a two-hander, but uh, hopefully entertaining nonetheless. When we take a break, I'm actually going to, to come in with a with a great YouTuber, the Miniature Maniac. You're going to like this segment. Val, tune in, especially if you're, especially you're painting and stuff. You're going to like this segment. I, I love uh, actually learning about this guy because he's got a he's got a significant following. I, I'm always blown away when you know someone appears out of nowhere and I'm like the only person who doesn't know who they are. So uh, <laughs> I, I look, I look forward not, to it. Man. This is like 45, 50 minutes of finishing moves. Oh man. Uh, yeah. Now, and, does and, he top Does he top the mud conversation from last week? Okay. Now I. I did ask, I said, look, can you explain, can you please explain uh, the difference between enamel and acrylic that I clumsily talk about in the last episode? And it just has to do with the solvent, doesn't it? No, you're, you're going to want to hear it. Okay. All right. The dude does great work. You, you know, please check out his YouTube channel and listen to the segment. And then, and then after, after that, we're going to have, you and I are going to have a finishing move segment. And you've seen that. You've seen my rust that I was talking about. We're going to talk about that Rizza rust. Actually, it's not, not Rizza rust. It's, 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 it's not the Rizza rust. It's not the Rizza rust. It's the Jizza rust. The Jizza arrest yeah <laughs> it, it's really cool when when a tip you get to you get to actually do it and it works out like this this is a a no skill tip that can really improve the way your models look if you're if that's the direction you want to go some people call them hacks other people call them techniques but they're all it's it's essentially uh, you, you build up enough of them you got some skill it's painting cheats so in the last episode, we were talking about like getting points for a painting rubric or whatever. It was brought up the fact that not every tournament uses a rubric for painting. And they're like, that's fine too. Like the stuff we talk about is actually, is, is going to make people notice your army. So even if it, there's not like a checkbox that you're going to get points for, you're still going to get noticed and get some points. So it's worth, it's, it's worth checking out. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, actually one of the only best painted awards I've ever won was just sort of a TO's discretion best painted. That's and I, was playing, I, I had a fully painted orc army. He liked orcs. And it worked out. Well, let, let me also be clear. It's like I think the best painted should be discretionary. Yeah. I mean, I, it's kind of like the, the People's Choice Award thing. I, I, I like that angle for sure. I don't know. It opens up the ability for a little bit of je ne sais quoi, you know, some sort of a wow factor, some of that people like. However, I would I would caveat, caveat this a lot. I was at the Beef and Wing, and um, the, the, the judge there was giving me particular, you know, I would say give me give me the business over over whether or not, you know, certain things qualify for me under the rubric. And it was the first time I realized that some people take the painting stuff as seriously as some of us take the gaming stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a bit humbled by that. That was my uh, that was my man uh, Mr. Well, Koska up well, what in, do you, up what in do Buffalo. You mean by that? I, I mean, like he, you know, it was he's clearly he had a very high bar for what his rubric meant or what so the you rubric mean meant. Each checkbox had to had to be more than what the face value of the checkbox was. Or here's one thing that I, you know, this is what got me out of the dugout, and this is why we were bumping chests, and I may have kicked a little dirt. Um, <laughs> this is personal, though. <laughs> to do with, well, I mean, I'm scrapping. You know, the best overall is the best I can hope for. So, you know, that's why I'm that's why I'm I'm, I'm gunning for whatever I can get. Just like you, I'm 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 scrapping for any you know rubric points I can get. Well, you leave nothing on the table. Like, yeah, you, you try, try to. to scoop every every point you possibly can. And and to me, first of all, I realized that hey, to this guy, this isn't a game. This isn't this isn't a game. This is real. To Mister <laughs> Mister David Koska. And uh, to him, you know, like for example, the the particular thing that we were arguing over was did my ma did my bases match my uh, my presentation board, oh, which wow. happened. Okay, yep, I'm listening. Which, hap this which happened important. to be which happened to be just like uh, uh, well, I don't want to plug too much, but uh, their former sponsor FLG it was a, it was one of their pre painted yeah. mats on one of their carrying trays. 
and uh, and match to me was like it matches. Like you know, if I'm wearing if I'm wearing like a you know a, you know a suit and I'm you know it's a blue suit and I've got a blue poof. It doesn't have to be the exact same blue. It just matches. You know that mat does match, right? It matches. What he really meant was is exactly the same, and this, <laughs> this definitely wasn't exactly the same. And so we argued this point for a long time and eventually we did come down in the middle uh, but uh, later on i was pulled aside and someone said hey uh, you were really giving it to costco back there and i was like Are you serious i was like no man we were just having a we we're just having a conversation like i was in buffalo i thought everything was cool but uh yeah so even even the 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 the, the hobby rubrics and metrics can get a bit heated um but i don't know if you've ever seen Costco's stuff i'm sure you've seen well points is points really points points I mean, but i mean he he is like if you if you look at his 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 style of painting is is like very intricate takes not not just a lot of effort but is 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 beautiful has a technique and has an artistic quality to it it's not a standard style of painting it uses a lot of brush strokes it's really gorgeous i realized i was trying to game a system that to him meant something Thing. You know what I mean? Like I was, I was trying to tick the box into him. It wasn't just a box. It was like a, it was an accomplishment. So, you know, I realized maybe, maybe we were misaligned a little bit on, on hobby, hobby rubrics and such. And but, I felt maybe a little though. bit bad pushing. I mean, my that, that sounds subjective, and that's part of it, I think. Sure, and that's why ultimately the manager does come out of the dugout and argue the call, whether or not it's still going to get called a strike or not. Um, you got, <laughs> you know, there is some subjectivity there, and if you are being competitive, you got to argue for it. But I did have sympathy at that moment for the ump- umpire, who who clearly uh, felt that there was there is more to it than that. Save and your I, sympathy for after the scoring has been done. <laughs> oh. I, <laughs> Certainly, all of this was in retrospect. Let us not mistake that. But uh, if if anyone at Beef and Wing 2018 felt that I was a little heated over the scoring rubric, let it be known that also a lot of it I was doing firmly tongue in cheek. I wasn't winning anything that weekend. That was part of my. That was my. That was my dark. You're Dark summer of 40k. <laughs> oh, you can you can hear the the plane crashing. Was, uh, oh man. Whew. Yeah. No. Well, clearly, clearly, if you're arguing over a few points on a paint rubric, you've got to, you got bigger fish to fry. Yeah, I was frying. <laughs> well, I was, you know, I, don't I was know in the if frying you know that. I, actually, let's take a quick break. Let's come back with that special segment, and then let's you and I come back and we'll talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. In just a second. All right. So hang tight, everybody. After this word from our sponsors, we'll have a special segment with the YouTuber I was talking about, and then we'll come back with Val and I. FTN is brought to you by Discount Games Inc. Please visit them at www.discountgamesinc.com. And don't forget to ask Jay about ways to save even more on your hobby projects. Hey everybody, welcome to a very special segment of Forge the Narrative. My name is Paul, your host. I am joined tonight by Scott the Mini Maniac. What up? You've got a YouTube channel. Yes. Uh, where you mm-hmm. mostly do painting tutorials. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Absolutely. <laughs> So it's youtube.com slash miniac. It's pretty simple to remember. The word miniac is a, is a wombo or a portmanteau between the word miniature and maniac because I love everything about miniatures. So I love the games. I love the lore. I love the process of painting. I love the culture surrounding it, the tools and techniques. And my channel is a reflection of that mania. So I make videos about everything from videos that make fun of the culture, like about people who love to strip everything they paint and, <laughs> you know, step by step tutorials about how to paint specific uh, miniatures or very in-depth reviews or uh, techniques, um, everything. I love it all. So I make videos about all of it. I'm a big fan. I, I watch your channel. I learn things along the way. What I, what I like is that you are kind of unsympathetic to the products. You use what works. Mm-hmm. You're, you're willing to, to try different things. It's it's a really nice channel. Yeah, I think the miniature painting community is the small communities. People are kind of afraid to say certain things are bad um, because they don't want to hurt people's feelings. And that's kind of understandable <laughs> because, you know, it still feels like more of a tight knit community than it does something so large. And that could be a good thing sometimes and also a bad thing sometimes because no one says a product is bad when it actually is bad. But, you know, we'll get there eventually. Uh, another thing I like is that you you should show your challenges with the miniatures. I mean, there could be a lot of th- stuff that gets edited, but it seems like you we're on the journey with you and we can see uh, where where it might be difficult for us that don't have the, the skill and the talent. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure when I started to do that because my earlier videos maybe showed a little bit of, of the challenges, but as of late in particular, I've been really going kind of deep on just totally 
showing every single mistake and problem that I run into and, and how I address it and with, while still trying to keep it entertaining and engaging, which can be a little bit of a challenge sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I like it. I mean, because it, it, it makes me feel like, oh, I'm, I'm probably going to make that mistake, too. But yet I can still get something that I like out of it. Yeah. Or hopefully avoid it and not do the same dumb thing that I probably did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, no, it's happening. I, I can promise. <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm pretty much a paint by numbers guy. I, I'm proud of what I do. And I think I, I get some some really good results, but I, I often say that I don't have really any talent. I use techniques uh, that I learn from watching stuff like this, or just the the fact that the products are getting better. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, to kind of to kind of uh, beat my way into a good looking miniature. Yeah, one thing I want to say about people who are paint by numbers painters that that is totally okay. A lot of people play 40k and Age of Sigmar and various other miniature war games, and paint painting is a means to an end for them, and that that's fine. Like they're not into the painting as much as I might be and they want to have a easy to follow kind of paint plan for for their minis and I mean I don't, I don't know if I come off like an elitist like you have to care about painting but I just want to come out and say that it's totally fine to be a paint by numbers painter <laughs> well I, I think that uh, you mentioned that you're very enthusiastic about the miniatures in general and that's mm -hmm. you know whatever I think that's that seems like why you're doing it why you're doing some of this stuff is, is showing people how they can they can turn what they what they have on their shelf whether they be just a tournament player or whatever into some really nice looking stuff I mean that's yeah that's it yeah. absolutely yeah I have uh, videos that target all kinds of different miniature painters. What got you into this? Because you don't play 40K. I mean, I assume you play games. Yes. Yeah. Last time I played 40K was 5th edition and I was like 12 years old. So that was, uh, <laughs> that was 15 years ago. I'm 27 now. I have a 40K army. I have a Dark Elder army. I just uh, I don't play it. I played Kill Team recently. But what got me into it, uh, there was a games workshop at a mall my mom used to bring me to when I was 10 years old. And I hated shopping with my mom. So I would just go and stand in there and stare at the miniatures <laughs> and eventually I, I bought some and the rest is history do you remember what it was oh heck yeah i wanted to buy the warhammer fantasy battle high elf starter set but she wouldn't let me get that because there were demons in fantasy yeah um so <laughs> she's a huge lord of the rings nerd so she got me the one of the lord of the rings starter sets i think it was the two towers one um so i started in lord of the rings and then migrated to fantasy and then migrated to 40k and then kind of just switched back between the two two of them for like the next 10 years. Do you play any other kind of games any, with any frequency? I mean, it didn't have to be miniature games, but, uh, like board games or whatever. Oh, heck yeah. Um, I do play another miniature game that I play pretty often is Guild Ball. I love Guild Ball and uh, board games. I have a ton of. I, I love uh, a lot of the Simon games. I love Blood Rage and the others. I have Hate coming on the way and other non-miniature board games that I love. I love Smash Up. It's a, a living card game. It's a lot of fun to play. Um, Dixit's a lot of fun. Mysterium's a lot of fun. Some other typical party games. Me and my wife like to play those with friends a lot. <laughs> so do, are they uh, people that you induct into somehow in this miniature gaming world? <laughs> are they normal people that... <laughs> Yeah, no, I've definitely sucked a few of my friends into uh, playing it. Some of the skirmish games are like really easy sells because uh, especially with Guild Ball, with Guild Ball, it's like 40 bucks. You get every single player you need, their cards, the ball, some custom terrain for your team, a goal and all the tokens for the team you get it in a box for like forty dollars and it's like really easy to be like get nice, this nice looking miniatures too yeah 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 they're great so yeah so I, I definitely gotten a few friends sucked into the world of miniatures when i have people over that that aren't gamers and i'm using the air quotes you can't see right now with plugins <laughs> to, like takaido yes yes uh, oh you know you're familiar with takaido yeah, we actually just bought it at a recent sale. It's a it, lot of fun. It, people don't realize they're being like super cutthroat till about halfway through the game. It takes yeah. two playthroughs because <laughs> it yeah. has such a friendly uh, appearance to it. <laughs> yeah, it's like really relaxed, but it's like also really aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> I played a game called uh, King Domino not that long ago either. I've never heard of that one. It, it's it's one of those um, German style games, game of the year, I think, something like last year or maybe the year okay. before. Um, it it is a it has a domino element to it, but it's one of those to where you you just kind of you feel like you're going through the motions, and then about halfway through the game, everyone's you know <laughs> trying to 
So, you know, go for go for the gold, as it were. Yeah, but, yeah, right. yeah. I like these kind of bridge things to the the people. But the, yeah, I guess one of the reasons that I'm bringing it up is that there's lots of different ways to en- enjoy this hobby, and that's it, you aren't uh, you know necessarily a 40k player, although you have 40k miniatures. But yeah, we can still talk and interact. And again, I still watch your channel because yeah. of all the stuff that you bring to it. Yeah, yeah. The world of miniatures is also so much bigger than just miniature wargaming. Like like there's uh, model kit people that assemble tanks and cars. And there's also like Gundam kit people that assemble massive Gundams. There is toy restoration people that share elements of what we do in miniature painting with taking a regular toy and expanding its like joint manipulation and giving it different materials. There is like this is going to sound crazy, but there's like dollhouse stuff, which shares a lot of the stuff that we do with uh, like fabricating uh, like a scenery. There's like HO scale model guys that do trains. So they're like the world of miniatures is, is gigantic in, in miniature work games. It's like a, a small subset of it. Uh, I just did a, a segment on this talking about mud. 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 Okay. It's, I, I have a segment called Finishing Moves where it's a, it's a, a five or ten minute segment to the things that I do to spend five or ten minutes on my models that make mm. them look a little bit, look a bit better. And what that either translates into, I want an extra point, like for pain judging, or I want someone to look at my stuff from three or four feet away and go, Oh man, that looks, you know, let me come take a closer look. Yes. Um, but I was talking about mud and how the products that we use on, on the miniature wargaming side is nowhere near the products that the model, like the World War II models or the model cars or whatever the people that try to make that super realistic looking stuff, uh, use. Yeah. You know, one big thing that's stands out now that you mentioned that is washes so like acrylic washes when you compare them to enamel or oil washes just like pale in comparison um enamel and and oil washes function so so much better than acrylic washes they just take a little bit more prep but like once you get that prep down like they they're they're fantastic and it's something that you never hear about as a miniature painter until you start to kind of like float into different categories of the miniature world uh, i i gave a fairly, fairly clumsy description of this that exact same thing same thing that you just mentioned uh I, it'll be by this time it'll be on last week's show would you mind describing the differences between <laughs> enamel uh and acrylic washes yeah sure i don't know about the differences between their actual like makeup like obviously instead of oh, the, uh, use. the use right the use yeah so the best thing about oil and enamel washes is that once they're dry you can still lift them up with uh white spirits so what you do with what the typical process is for model kit painters and also for for miniature painters if they want to is typically you would you know, apply it in a haphazard way, um, your oil or enamel wash. And uh, an oil or enamel wash, if you if you still have some of those paints from back in the day when you painted model cars, it's just a combination of white spirits and enamel paint or white spirits and, and oil paint. And it, it has – it's so good at cleaning to the recesses. So whatever, you apply it. It goes into the into the the recesses, and then what you can do is you can dab it up with like a Q-tip and some white spirits. And since it has such a long working time, you could like do an entire tank and still come back with a cotton swab and clean that up and get a really nice sharp line in all of your grooves. Having you know just wash something for ten minutes, it won't dry that fast. And even when it does dry, it can still be lifted up. So it's it's super convenient for that reason. But the one thing that makes it a little bit harder to work with is white spirits can tend to lift acrylic paint and so what you need to do is you need to hit the model with some kind of protective layer of varnish first and then then you're fine then your your white spirits won't eat away at your paint do you think it is satin say better than that in this instance or does it matter can you use whatever you have on hand yeah actually to get the best mileage out of any wash acrylic included applying it to a glossy surface glossier the better makes it function so what you'll see a lot of guys do sometimes a typical process for commission painters who are like bash painting space marines is they'll lay their base coat down They'll do highlight and shading however they see fit, apply a super high glossy finish to it, and then oil wash or enamel wash, more more often than not oil wash something, let the oil wash cure because it takes a long time, and then apply uh, maybe a satin or a matte varnish over top of it and then continue with the rest of the miniature. Hmm. Yeah, uh, that's neat. Uh, You are, the drying time is is real. Like I I can mix up some of um, the the, stuff. I I, I do a lot of weathering on one of my armies and I mix up uh, some AK stuff with some white spirits mm-hmm. and I could come back five, 10 hours later and my wash pot is 
is still usable. It's maybe not yeah. the best, but it's still usable. Yeah, absolutely. And like that, that people paint miniatures themselves with just straight oil paints, not not just washes. Whoa. And 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 take advantage of that that benefit. There are there are a few that I could actually list, and they get really great results because you can just blend forever because it never dries. Well, I mean, it does eventually, but <laughs> not any time in a reasonable fashion. So it's handy, and it's also a little bit inconvenient at times to to work with. I couldn't. I would end up with paint all over myself. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, just all over. Yeah. I haven't tried that yet. I haven't tried painting names with oil paints. It's definitely something people do, but yeah, that, that is a little bit harder than just using oils as a wash. There are a lot of things you need to consider when you when you start to get into the, the world of oil paints. There would be so much swearing. <laughs> a lot of frustration for sure. <laughs> Oh, but no, no, that's, uh, thanks, thanks for describing that. That is one of the things, you know, when you start looking, if you just go get a magazine off the shelf, one of those hobby magazines that have all, has all this historical stuff in it, it's the, the depths that they go are typically leaps. I mean, on their average is leaps and bounds above what we do on the, the miniature wargaming side of things. Typically right. is what I can see. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, but the products, the products are getting better for me. And that's, and that's kind of, I try to use things that, that just work. And thankfully we're, we're, we're living in a time where, where that is possible. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of transparency on the internet about finding out which tools are the best and which products actually work is definitely helping that. So you, you've done some things on your channel where you actually compare the science. Uh, maybe that's too, too strong, strong of a term and I don't want to <laughs> put it. <laughs> I don't want to make, I don't want to put it on you if that's not what you're trying to do, but you, you, uh, you do a lot of, uh, experimentation on certain products. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I, and I think that's, that's really cool to see because again, you kind of go with, go into it with this unsympathetic approach to it and just give some analysis on what the actual results are. Yeah. Yeah. I have a pet peeve about people saying things without testing the things they, they say. And then like people just like regurgitate that information. And then like there's this spiral of misinformation that occurs and it just, <laughs> just takes the miniature community by storm. So I, I like to test a lot of things like uh, typical ones are like, does varnish actually cloud a miniature when it's humid outside? Or can I prime when it's like below zero degrees or when it's super humid outside or uh, uh, what was a, the a lot of things like that? that. Uh, I haven't done the varnish one yet. I'm holding on to that one. But for my priming tests, I primed in like 95% humidity and I primed at like like 16 degrees and both worked fine. So the only claim that I can make is that for the primer that I used, which was in that case Citadel Corax White, it's, not, it's unaffected. Now, I will say that one of my patrons actually did prime outside when it was cold and his his miniature looked like he applied like a ghrelin earth crackle medium all over it. Mm. So not all primers are made equal, but at the very least, the one that I used was was fine. Yeah, no, I can see that. I definitely have have been in the middle. It's, we've had like wet winters here in, mm -hmm. in Georgia. And mm -hmm. so I've been sitting in my paint desk like, oh. It's raining outside, but I still need to get these 10 miniatures painted. I'm going to go prime. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and does it work? Have you had problems? I haven't had any problems, but, but I, but I also know that in my history of doing this, there's been problems. Now, was it my fault? I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, the obviously answer is yes, but. <laughs> 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 but I don't, I don't know if it was a combination of, of what I normally do or was I, was I having an off priming day or whatever. But, but there is, there's that, uh, that hesitation in, when it's, when it's raining or it's been raining a lot, whether or not I'm going to go in and, uh, and prime these miniatures that I know I'm going to need, to, you know, to have at a competition level. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. There are a lot of things when priming that you can mess up with if you're not using proper technique and then blaming out environmental things is definitely a reality. <laughs> but yeah. So it's, it's hard to say what might have occurred. Well, I mean, you can't argue with your with your test either. So right, yeah, have the evidence there. Right, yeah, but you know, unfortunately, the naysayers might say that oh, you didn't test it with every single primer, and that's why. Oh, so your miniature was warm. Yeah. Oh, so that's you know, actually, this is something that's interesting to bring up. Um, I have a friend who works in works for or at, least at one point worked for a company that tested paint that went on airplanes, and so they have a lot of very interesting tests that they did. And I was talking to him about like, okay, what could have what could have affected the results? to my test and he said the temperature of the primer itself and also the temperature of the miniature itself so like if both items are inside and then you go outside and 
apply the primer and then bring them back inside. Like they're not going to change temperature in a drastic way that will affect your application of primer. But if like one of them was outside and is freezing cold and the other is inside and it's warm and you spray one of the things, when you have a cold a temperature differential, it's going to condensate and that would cause issues. So there are so many variables that could be tested. But, you know, at some point, it's just like really pedantic and annoying to do. Um, but, you know, it's fun to talk about. At least. I think I think we're back to priming only at uh, between <laughs> 78 and uh, 84 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. I start breaking out all these things to, to worry about. And it's like, oh, screw it. I'm just going <laughs> to wait. We j- like five minutes ago, we said it was cool. And now we're back to <laughs> you got to be really careful. OK, you got to run out. So you need to carry your miniatures in your pocket for yeah. 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Run outside. Yes. Spray them and then come back in. Yep. All right. I'm going to make a video on how to prime. It's going to like involve like a space heater and like a, a carrying case to keep them all at the same temperature and like a time range. It gets real complicated. <laughs> like a, one of those uh, thermometers they hack chickens with or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That would be very interesting to watch, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, Maybe. You, you recently did one on airbrushes. I mean, that's airbrushes seems to be the one of the biggest mysteries out there for people that are just getting into. Because that's 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 um that's kind of one of the big hobby evolutions. Okay, I've got my miniatures. Okay, now I'm using primer. Now I'm now I've I've done that for five years, and now I hear about airbrushes. I'm going to go to to get an airbrush and base coat. Like some people, they, they never make that transition because getting into the whole airbrush stuff is just too mysterious and too many products out there. A little bit of confusion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, airbrushes. Um, I don't know when they started to really infiltrate miniature painting. I know I probably bought one around probably seven or eight years ago and just started using it for remedial tasks like priming and base coating. But yeah, there are an incredible amount of airbrushes that you can buy and you know, it just adds another layer of complexity and another layer, like you said, of mis- of, of mystery. Um, because the questions are, what 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 uh what airbrush do I buy? What compressor do I buy? Like, what paints work? How much do I thin those paints? Like, what PSI do I shoot? There are so many variables that people want to just give like uh like like a value to, and that's just not how art works a lot of times, and it just makes it a little bit more difficult. <laughs> yeah. And, and then uh, they hear the horror stories about cleaning it. I actually just, I was talking <laughs> to somebody on Twitter. I said the, the first time I took apart my airbrush was absolutely terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's so many small little fiddly bits that you can so easily lose or break. Because you're cleaning near the sink or whatever. And it's just, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it is. It's like, I know my blood pressure was up first time. <laughs> now, now it's, it's fine or whatever, but, uh, but, uh, but I like how you, again, you went about it in a way that's, and you actually, you actually hit the big ones. So if anyone is, uh, or I guess what I would say the, the commonly, you, uh, used ones, the ones you hear about in forums or, you know, message posts or whatever. Right. So yeah. If, if anyone is curious as to, if they're just wanting to get in that step, that's another thing you do on your channel, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think I have two airbrushing videos. One discusses the, the four commonly used airbrushes and another one discusses discusses like the 12 things that I learned about airbrushing in the in the the year that I really took it seriously. Um, I think that's an important thing too. I think like I said earlier, a lot of people regurgitate information that they just hear from other people. But those 12 things are all things that I, I learned from making mistakes the entire year and, and, and made into a video. And that, that was kind of helpful. Uh, well, not helpful. But that was good to see that a lot of people responded well to that kind of that kind of idea. Because again, my pet peeve of people say, Saying things they don't actually know, but anyways, I digress. I'm getting I'm getting salty right now. Okay, <laughs> I can tell there's there's one or two people out there you really want to mention right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe. No, no, not definitely. Not. <laughs> oh, that, that's awesome. So, okay, now we have we've we talked about the Japan miniatures. You actually have a series where you call them the heavy metal marine series, mm-hmm. which you you try to replicate the box art or the website art or whatever from Games Workshop, uh, and you and you talk about the process of how really how long that takes and how how awesome those mini- all, the, all the work that goes into those miniatures. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love Duncan, and a lot of people love Duncan, but the stuff he paints is not what the box art looks like. And he does that because he wants to make uh, the box art more accessible to people. Because if you were an, a novice painter and you went home and tried to paint like Evy Mel does, you would feel very defeated. And I mean, e- even now, I've been painting for like 17 years. I can't get it exactly. And it's it's, it's a very technical and a very uh, annoying way to paint. You brought you brought that up. I have a, the seventh installment of that series coming out on, I think it's the 24th. 
Is that a Friday? Let's see here. Of, yes. of January of this month, 2019. Of this month, yeah. So in the past, I've done Dark Angels, Blood Angels, Ultramarines, uh, all kinds of stuff. But in this newest one, I'm doing a Chaos Space Marine. I'm doing the Black Legion. So very, I'm pretty excited. topical. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I picked up uh, Blackstone Fortress, and I'm painting one of the Chaos Space Marines from that. But they also just announced that new Sorcerer at, uh, what was it, Warhammer Open? Is that what they called it? Uh, Yep. Yeah. And that guy looks absolutely nutty. Flames everywhere. Yeah. 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 That guy, uh, I, I think the, I even like the one that came out recently. There was a, the World Claimer. This guy's named Harkin War Claimer. Sorry not, yep. to get, not to get too nerdy here right now. No, no. I I, um, I know who you're talking about. Uh, but yeah. it's it's a great looking model. I mean, the, I, I love everything that's come out. Like, yeah, they are. Wise, it's it's a it's so above. They are really killing it. Like I think in in 2018, I I did a really good job of not buying anything. I, I maybe maybe bought like maybe like five miniatures or something like that, and then maybe about more. I can't remember. But now, like in the end, in quarter four of 2018, and in the beginning of 2019, holy cow, there are so many things that I want to buy and that I am buying. Uh, Blackstone Fortress being being one of them, but also. The Necromunda kits, House Delac and also Caldor. I yeah. bought both of those. They're freaking awesome. Yeah, Caldor is is awesome. I mean, I, yes, I'm actually using their, their bits right now to make to kit bash some other things. Oh yeah, yeah, super awesome like bit selection for sure. And then what's the other thing? Oh, the I don't even play Blood Bowl, but the Undead Blood Bowl team that came out. Yes, freaking awesome. No, I, mummies I, are trucks. They are yeah. absolutely awesome. Yeah, so I I picked that up as well. You talk about like, Guild Ball. Uh, my my equivalent. Of Guild Ball for my generation was Blood Bowl. I think yep. I think it's their best one-off game. Or like, let me say, I think it uh, it's in contention now for their best one-off game. But when you get games like the Silver Tower and Blackstone Fortress, you know it's. The competition is steep. Yeah, you know, I, I actually heard good things about Blackstone Fortress because, like, kind of the the track that they had been going on was, you know, they made a game and it was cool because the miniatures were cool and the game wasn't necessarily that great. One that comes to mind was a was a corn game where you went into like a an arena as like one of the the soldiers mm-hmm. and you fought and you know the game wasn't really compelling but the miniatures inside of it were it was, it was a great deal on the miniatures. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So now with these uh, new games coming out it's good to see that the, the gameplay is also compelling you can play those games with people that that aren't into this mini game and stuff uh, yeah. there's, it, there's a little bit of story element there's a there's a little bit of uh, uh of dice mechanics and in moving stuff around but you don't get too bogged down in it and you can have fun yeah absolutely absolutely yeah i think blackstone fortress the, the miniatures are absolutely i mean they're, they're stunning and they have you know of course a lot of game applications too which is which is nice from my side <laughs> but, oh yeah, that's uh, right. You can I, don't all of the models from their board games can't they all be used in 40k itself? Yes, they have. Well, okay, they have rules for 40k. Okay, they're, they're not like super powerful. I mean, because you got to mention these are also just like humans and stuff. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, right. You know, trying to fight Carnifex is probably not going to work out for them. But yeah, you know, actually, let's 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 dive into that a little bit. I was thinking about this. There's a, a Chaos Space Marine Lord in Blackstone Fortress. I haven't played the game yet, but like, how do you deal with that as a regular human being or uh, an El- a single Eldar? I-, I haven't gotten all the way through it. I think he has to be. He has to be the end boss, right? Ex- yeah, because like space marines are a big deal. Like they're they don't go down easily. <laughs> when you're, when you're what throwing I rocks at him, when the guy's waving his vape pen, you know, at the yeah, it's exactly. Not, it's probably not going to work out. Probably not going to work out. No. <laughs> oh, I love how they brought in the deep lore too. Like the the men of iron, that robot that's in there. Oh yeah, that guy is. I don't know anything about his lore but that model looks sweet it does but it's one of those things to where that that faction has existed for i I don't know 35 years or something or or, but no one's ever seen a model or never thought they would be in the game and and then uh the way the the game works now is that all the every model has a set of faction keywords and he's got a unique faction keyword that just makes you it really just sucks you in (laughs) (laughs) yeah people are hoping that maybe there's going to be more men of iron coming out i presume yeah yeah okay or or you know it rewards them for someone that sees that and knows that it like keys off all those those rewards triggers in your brain or whatever yeah yeah well that's cool i didn't actually know that was a an entire faction that's pretty cool uh yeah 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to be, uh, I'm probably going to get it wrong and I'll hear about it as soon as I do, but it's like <laughs> during the like end of the dark age of technology or before, I don't know, something. It was mentioned a long time ago. And okay. It's finally come to fruition for a lot of people. Awesome. That's awesome. Okay. But I think it's neat when they are sitting down to create these things that that stuff makes its way in. And again, because part of, you know, why we do this is that because we love the way they look or we're attracted to something, we talk about this a lot on the show, is that the actual act of playing this game, uh, if you were to pie chart it all out, is probably a thin sliver. Uh, we, the, the biggest chunk of it is the, the putting together the stuff, the painting the stuff, the reading about the stuff, the, the, um, the fantasizing about the stuff. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one. Um, <laughs> thinking about like what kind of lists you want to use, thinking about the backstory of your army. Yeah, for sure. Trying to you know, put mental, all these color schemes and, and stuff in your brain and, and then how you're going to equip them, you know, oh man, I would pose. And then when you're, when you're posing them, thinking about, oh, he's, he's jumping over this rock and he's going to be shooting somebody in the face. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, I kind of, I kind of missed that actually a little bit because now, um, I don't want to call it painting maturity, but I, I, I've come to the point where everything I paint doesn't need to be the best paint job that I can produce. And in some cases, that's actually kind of an, an, an unhealthy way to paint. But like, I kind of miss that just like reckless abandon that like I maybe used to have when I was painting miniatures where like everything that I was painting, like when I was painting it, like that was my one thing that I was doing and I was super into it and I was doing everything that I could to make it look perfect. Um, but now I have like 10 things going on at the same time and I kind of just churn out miniatures, uh, to a certain degree. And that's a little bit, that's a little sad now that I think about that. Well, I mean, do you think that you could sit down and you, could you paint an army now it, 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 in your normal work, uh, workflow and, and content creation flow that you do now? Would you, would you be able to transition to that army painter? Are you down? Do you, are you a squad painter? Uh, do you like to just, you know, really trick out one miniature and move on to something completely different? Yeah. I think, um, well, the answer your first question with the content creation uh, schedule I, I can't paint anything that's not going to go into a video so everything that I paint is is subject of a video and um, I would love to paint an army um, I have a fairly large collection of, of wood elves which are called wanderers now and oh, yeah. Sigmar I have about I don't know maybe 1200 paints uh, 1200 points painted and then I have like uh, several thousand more unpainted but like if you if you did the same oh, so you pattern, do play that you are a collector you are <laughs> oh for sure for sure yeah I mean you you don't play this game for 15 years and, and not a mass a sea of miniatures. Uh, sorry, I jumped in there. You were, uh, no, you, I, uh, could you, could you, uh, you have 1200 points. Could you finish it up and, and. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Um, the problem is that people would get bored of seeing the same content for like two months in a row. If I were to paint wood elves for two months in a row. So I feel the need to, to spice it up and to make content about things that are relevant. For instance, I made a video about Aquaman when the movie came out or a video that includes a Blackstone Fortress miniature when the box game comes out, etc. So I feel the need to kind of to kind of hit those those points of uh i don't know social media buzz oh, yeah there's no yeah there's no shame in that right yeah but then the unfortunate side is that i don't have time to to do anything because when i when i do this stuff is in my free time away from my normal 40 hour a week job so that doesn't leave much time other than for sleeping and eating food so <laughs> hopefully hopefully at some point if i do the the youtube thing full time i'll have time to then just you know be a normal miniature painter again and paint my wood elves and paint my dark elder army and have fun well i guess more do you actually would do you think you take any joy in painting a, a whole army mm. and i guess that's the second part of the question as opposed to what you're doing now which is i guess you know what i only know what i've seen which is uh, you know a diorama here and there um a miniature from from xyz game mm -hmm. right yeah is there anyone out there that actually likes painting units of people <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Uh, you know, I'm going to let that question to a question. You know? <laughs> I'm going to let that fly. That's, uh, that's, that's very true. Okay. Cause I love the end product. I love it. Um, but the process, holy cow. Once you get like 20% in, it's like, this is really a slog. Okay. I'm painting um, 50 conscripts right now. 50. Uh, and 50. I did, I did not, I did not pity you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's you did this to yourself. No, no, I know, I know. Fifty, but it, and the, here's the here's the bad thing is that there I had to I'm having to paint fifty more. I already own probably 120, but oh, these no. need to be in a different shade, you know. Oh no! <laughs> so it's, 
That's terrible. It really. It, I mean, I know. I'm not. I'm not. I'm commiserating. I'm not really complaining. You know? No. Yeah. No. It's okay. I, I. I get it. I've been there. We. Uh. There was a. Are you familiar with Reddit? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There was a, a thing on the the Warhammer subreddit called uh, uh something Warlords. I can't remember what it was, but it was essentially paying a thousand points in six months. Um. And there was a three month checkpoint if you hadn't completed five hundred points by three months, and you were kicked out. And then Ooh. at the end of the six months, there was like a competition to see who had the best painted army. So I, I participated in this uh, with my wood elves and I came out the other end as I this is actually a fun question so I think of like f- Something like 512 people uh, that said they were going to do the 1,000 points. Do you want to guess how many actually completed? Oh, man. Six calculation. 60. All right. One second. I'm going to do some math real quick. It was 7% of people. So 35. Oh. Of like 512 people or so, something like that. Like a, a disgusting amount of people. So I, w- I really would imagine more got over the line with a poor paint job is what I would imagine. <laughs> That's really what I was imagining. You're like, or, oh, yeah. Yeah. Or, or half of them were Necron players or something. Right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. The kind of life just gets in the way and it gets you distracted. It, um, it does. Man, I believe in accountability partners. I mean, oh, yeah. I got people that I just send picture. Oh, look, this is what I'm doing today. I post stuff on Twitter and, and a little bit on Instagram too, but I get worried the same thing. Like, oh, this is like the sixth picture of this tank. I don't want yeah. to fatigue people or whatever, but, <laughs> but I got other people I send it to. <laughs> so, yeah. So. <laughs> You know, that's a, that's a good idea. And actually, the original reason why I started the YouTube channel was to finish a Blood Angel commission that was like sucking my soul. So I felt like if I was involved in the hobby via making videos, it'd make me more likely to to paint the Blood Angels. And it did. I actually finished that stupid commission and then moved on to greener pastures. <laughs> um, but yeah, we were talking about uh, oh, uh, painting units. So yeah, when I when I'm painting an army, when I would paint an army for, uh, an army for that uh, competition. I definitely intermingled heroes in between like units. I'd paint a unit of 10 guys and I'd paint a character or two characters and then paint another character, uh, paint another unit and kind of just do it that way. Cause painting a hero is so nice because, you know, I, I can, I can whip out a wood elf hero in like maybe like four to five hours. Nice. Um, and it's such a good feeling to see a completed miniature without investing too much time. And then that, that will like, kind of motivate you to keep going into the next thing. If you only painted units like in a row, like I think that would probably kill my I don't want to, I want to say motivation but that would kind of kill my momentum I do I, I do want to talk about motivation with you at some point because you actually I, I, I don't remember when the video was but you, you made a great point about motivation yeah yeah let's talk uh, about motivation you, you mentioned that it's great when you got it but you know you don't need it and don't rely on it right yeah there's this there's this quote and I'm gonna butcher it well I'll just t- tell you the gist but <laughs> it was from a violin player and like the question was like how do I find motivation to practice and essentially the gist of the answer was you know you do not wait for motivation to make itself available to you you create a routine of practicing and then when motivation comes and you ride the waves of motivation and then when motivation goes away you still have your routine to, to fall back on so for me in content creation I've been making YouTube videos for the last three years and the way that I've been able to not like kind of fizzle and pop um, is because I have a routine every morning from 5 to 7 a.m. I make videos and lately every Monday evening and Thursday evening I also work on YouTube videos and when I've established that, you know, it's it's really easy to maintain it. But like if I was just, you know, like hoping that I was motivated at five in the morning, I would <laughs> I would have made it past two months. Like no way. <laughs> Uh, that's that's a, that's a great point. I, I painted uh, thirty plague bearers in the span of two days, and I was incredibly pleased with my results. I'm talking nice. about like I think that they're 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 showpiece quality plague bearers, and I was I felt like I could conquer the freaking world. Where where are the pictures at? I'll send you one. I'll send you one. <laughs> I, I like it, but uh, Pix, uh, Pixar didn't happen, man. I'll send no. Well, they're up on uh, on my Twitter. Okay, uh, and uh, yes, yeah, so, so they're they're out there. People have verified I've at least painted them. I don't want <laughs> I don't want to speak to the quality, but although I am very proud of them, <laughs> I'm sure and, they're great. Well, then I'm like I can do this, man. I'm gonna bang out thirty blood letters. Yes. That took about three weeks. Oh, no, what happened? (laughs) 
<laughs> it just, I don't, I don't know. My heart wasn't in it. They, well, really what it was is that I didn't have a list where they, where I, I was going to use them. Okay. And that was it. And, and I hadn't built my demon prints that go, that went with them yet. And I mean, there was, I was, I don't, the answer is I don't know because, but I think it translated into the, it not getting done faster and, or whatever. I, I, I really, uh, I rode the momentum with the plague bearers and then it all came crashing to a halt with the, the blood letters. But I did yeah. start it, I, how I got through it eventually. And this is kind of like my new routine is in situations like this, I'm going to do five figures a night. Yeah. Uh, and it, and I'm doing some orcs right now also and the cultist. I don't know why I've, I've decided to have models with this, or armies with this many models in it. Yeah. You are just, you're going all out. You I, got all kinds of armies. <laughs> But then my, my five models turned into like two and a half models, but they're still getting done. I'm still kicking stuff out. It's not like one hour a night kind of thing. I know that's a, that's a, uh, that's a, something that people try to attain to. Um, yeah. but, uh, but I do make myself get money routine is when I've got projects like this, I'm going to get three or four of these figures done tonight if I can't get the whole squad done. But I got to quit picking things with 30 people in the squad. That's what. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that's, uh, I, I think that's another thing people don't realize is how much you can get done in like a month if you paint somewhat regular regularly like you can yeah. you'll really surprise yourself like like whoever's listening to this podcast like just paint uh for like like you just said for an hour a day for a whole month straight and you will you will blow your mind how much you actually get done i got several friends that are commission painters and and, and people are like how do you do it so fast he's like this it's i paint for eight, eight ten hours a day that's yeah yeah <laughs> that's that's why i put out more work than you that's <laughs> yeah uh, I, I mean that's it but that that's the same thing that we do with our other job i mean with our jobs I and mean, that's yeah. that's we are we are more productive you know whatever. right yeah you're just yeah you're just doing it more more frequently yeah for sure just, and it, but you're like you're talking about you get into that you you establish that routine for yourself and then uh, you know i like what you said and then when you do get something that uh that really compels you then you can you'll you'll get there so if you re- you'll do it better and you do it faster uh and you'll have more you'll have your army on the table faster and and that's really what uh, what i think is the is the barriers like put all the love into it but also keep playing and get playing how do you get playing faster you got to get stuff painted you got to get out yes. there and then get to tournaments that's that's kind of one of the focus of, of our show is uh is making that path seem like something that you can travel um, right yeah and actually having having a tournament or some kind of um deadline is a is a fantastic way to ensure that you actually get stuff done so that's, <laughs> that's a that's a good way to, to to ensure that it's like cramming for a test um, exactly most of the work gets done the night before <laughs> Yeah, yeah. In in one of my really old videos I said, uh like if you if you really want to improve, uh create deadlines and, and create um punishments for not accomplishing those deadlines. So it's like an example would be like, okay, I'm gonna I wanna be able to 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 paint a unit of ten space marines in a week of work. And if I don't accomplish that um, if you're like a, a 16 year old, you could say something like, I can't use my Xbox for like a month and like stick to it. And then like, then oh, when you, discipline, I know, right. When you, when you stick to it, then your word to yourself has real value. And then, then what this, this is going to spiral into something else right now. But <laughs> so I, what I, one thing people I think don't realize is when they, when they make a promise to themselves, like, and, and they don't meet that promise, uh, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but that just, that just gives you less and less belief in yourself that whenever you make a promise to yourself, you're never going to accomplish it. So like when you, when you make a promise to yourself, one, make sure you can actually accomplish it. Don't do anything ridiculous. But two, if you don't accomplish it and you set some kind of punishment for yourself, actually go through with the punishment. And then later when you do it again, you're going to be like, well, I'm actually serious about this. And then you're going to, you're going to do even better second time around. But yeah, be, be honest to yourself and, you know, ensure that your own word has, has value in your life. Then you can, you can conquer the world. And you can set your goals as, yeah. as small or as big as you want. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. As long as you follow through with that process. I think that's, that's, that's great advice. Yeah. Do you have some favorite products? Do you find things are easier to use that help you get some of this stuff done to the quality that you do? I guess, what, what's the secret to making stuff look good? Hmm. Okay. I'll answer your first question. Are there any products that I like? Um, I don't love any paint range. Every single one has its defects, um, and also its its pros and its cons. Um, there, I, I like wet palettes. You probably are familiar with these. Not not a biggest fan of the everlasting wet palette, but the normal Masterson Stay Wet palette or just a normal Tupperware one uh, works great for me. Um, so wet palette is a, an essential tool of my process. 
I love uh, sable hair brushes, particularly one called the Raphael A404. I've tried a lot of them, and the Raphael is my favorite. And so that that's another thing. I can't really think of anything else that I couldn't live with a different brand of. Um, maybe, maybe washes. Army Painter Strong Tone is great, and also Citadel washes are really good if you're looking for expedient painting. That's 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 a must-have. But everything else is replaceable in in my in my mind. No, that's nice. I mean, that's, that's good to know. What is next for you as far as um, whether some other? I know we talked a little bit about videos you're working on, but mm-hmm. uh, what are some? Are, are you tackling any, any any exciting topics or anything you'd like to cover right now? Yeah. Um, well, in the end of March, Crystal Brush is happening, or Adepticon. Um, and are, are you going to Adepticon this year? Absolutely. I go every year. Yeah, so there's a co- competition there, if you don't know, called Crystal Brush. And it is the, I want to say it's the premier miniature painting event of the world. And the reason why I make such a bold claim like that is because they put out serious cash for the winners. And that attracts all kinds of different painters from all around the world. And I think another reason why that's the case is because I think there's a rule at Crystal Brush where you can't enter a model that's been entered in another uh, competition already. So Crystal Brush is like the beginning of the competitive season. And then like what you'll see is like best in show in, in Crystal Brush will then go on to win other things at Monte San Savino, at uh, like Scale Model Challenge and other competitions because they don't have that same requirement. So Crystal Brush sets the pace for the year. So you see for the first time all these amazingly painted things because everyone's going for that, you know, best in show $7,000 paycheck. Um, so yeah, that, that that's really cool. So I, I bring that up because I like, to, I like to have at least one thing that I put in Crystal Brush. And the only reason why I like to do that is because I like to um, just get feedback from people who are way better than me um, because I can point to something in the case and be like, hey, that's my thing. Can you crap all over it? And, and then they do that. So after the, the the Black Legion video comes out, from then until the end of March, I will be working on a single fantasy entry for Crystal Brush. And it's going to be a diorama of a, of a witch who's being burnt at a cross and is happy about it. I like really dark things. And, <laughs> and to me, that's really dark. It's very sinister. Um, so I'm going to see if I can make an interesting series out of that. Uh, that sounds awesome. Are do you have already the the parts and stuff? Is this this doesn't sound like a standard off the shelf kit? No, yeah, it's it, it'll be a little bit of a conversion. I I have the model picked out and actually made part one of this series, which was which was planning. Um, and now I just have to continue with it. So yeah, I got the mini, got the idea, I got the basic schematic for what the base is going to look like, and now I just need to actually um, make it a reality. Man, that's awesome. So where where can people find you uh, if they if they if they like what they're hearing right now? Which your videos are awesome. I'll go ahead and say that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So thank people you. should check it out if they aren't already familiar with you. Where can they find you? Um, yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, you can find me at youtube.com slash miniac and miniac is spelled M I N I A C. Um, I also have an Instagram where I post work in progress stuff and pictures of completed stuff. And that one's a little bit harder to remember because the person who has the miniac handle on Instagram is a mini Cooper lover and he won't give up the name. Like I've even, <laughs> I've like offered money to him and he's like no like i want to keep it and i was People like okay, serious about their minis man yes they are um but my instagram handle is m-i-n-i-a-c-a-l underscore so it's like the word maniacal but take the a and put an i in there and then toss an underscore on the end and then beyond that there is patreon so patreon is a way that i fund uh what i do as a content creator and that's patreon.com slash miniac for some some fun rewards but that's that's pretty much it well awesome man well thanks for coming on and taking the time tonight absolutely thanks for having me i love doing podcasts they're so much fun well hopefully i can touch base with you again especially as we be closer to the crystal brush and i guess just check in with you yeah sure if that works for you and your audience i'd love to do that well awesome scott have, have a great rest of your night and we will talk very soon see ya we're sponsored by firmaterra with their study lightweight and portable tables you can make war anywhere please visit them at www.firmaterra.com Hey everybody, we are back. Val. Yes. That was an awesome segment. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it. I really enjoyed talking to Scott. He's a good dude. He seems like a very cool guy. Yeah, I, th- I think if you if you dig deeper into his channel, uh, you will see uh, some things that you can practically apply to your miniatures. Well, I, I really need as much practicality as humanly possible, so I will be <laughs> definitely delving in there. 
Well, remember, you know, we talk about all the time. We'll talk about this in a few minutes. The finishing move segment is that the cheats that we call them are techniques for certain artists. So, which I'm not saying that, that he did, but that's what we're going to talk about is like easy ways that you can really apply some of this stuff. Well, I mean, I don't know if I'm going a little too far off the deep end here, but when you think of like a video game, each 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 effect that you see graphically is its own little program, is its own little thing that's hmm. you know created and designed on as, as as an individual piece. And as we've gone through you know 30 years of development, there are all these layers that are built on top of each other that provide us with these like you know virtually realistic or photorealistic games and really what they are are just a whole bunch of little hacks and techniques that have been piled on top of each other so painting is no different so so we're getting closer to the lvo yeah you're going to be competing i mean (laughs) i'll be i'll be in the big tournament Uh, you'll be playing i shouldn't say competing (laughs) you're registered there's at least one round in which val happelfinger will be competing for the championship come on you're taking you're taking orcs which which orcs were uh Probably a long shot uh, at the last year's event, but pretty strong contender for this event. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, right now we've got two of the, you know, I would say most recognizable names in 40K, uh, Matt Root, uh, Nick Nanabadi. Both of them are taking uh, orcs. Matt Root, not so, actually, by the way, I'm saying it wrong, Matt Rutt. Uh, is uh, not surprising. He loves orcs. In fact, he famously had the uh, Deptus Mechanicus uh, War Convocation, Orc Convocation that mm-hmm. he built. And then how more, much more surprising is uh, Eldar lover extraordinaire Nick. He switched over to the orcs, and uh, that's a big deal. So we'll see. So we got two guys who are both former ITC champions, you know, getting ready to uh, bring orcs to the LVO. So to sleeve up orcs. I mean, I mean, both people. Uh-oh. I mean, I, I think. Matt uh, is less of a of a, a chaser of that efficiency than maybe some of the, the other players, but it still is to be said they are taking orcs. I mean, Matt Matt doesn't mess around. It's not like he doesn't have a good ranking this year, and he's got and he's got a real life. Oh, absolutely, no, no, <laughs> no, no, no. no, so, no like, this, that's, that's uh, not against any of the players. I'm just saying that yeah. they're uh, one may be incentivized to, incentivized to take orcs because they are super powerful. One is is probably less incentivized, be, but also an orc enthusiast. Well, I mean, if you look at orc enthusiast, but also you look at their play styles. So you got uh, you know Matt, who's very much an aggressive player. Uh, likes come in with, you know, I think, I think what he's termed, maybe other people have termed for him, I don't know, max threat overload type. He played seven flying high tyrants at sure. Adepticon, in which he beats Nick Donabody in the final table. And so he's, he's all about that aggression. Orcs very much have that power. On the flip side, you got Nick Donabody. He's all about, you know, he, he's Trixie Eldar player. He's more of a reactive player. He said this many times in a lot of his articles and things that you can read around the internet. He likes to, you know, react to his opponent and play a, a, a game slightly differently. Um, and it's interesting to me that a mono code, like a, a single faction codex, not a, you know, a supable uh, hybrid army like Eldari or Imperium or Chaos. Mm, the orcs, I, I got something to say about that. I'm the orcs. You, I'm say your piece. I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you finish. What I'm saying here is, it's cool that two of the best players in 40k that we know of can both have their needs met, like their stylistic needs met by this orc codex. So that is a pretty good vote of confidence in how good that book is. Agree, but where where my uh, conjecture is on that is that uh, when you say not supable, I think that the factions themselves within the codex lead to them being supable. I mean, I'm literally talking about the fact that, you know, Imperium draws on more than 10 books. You know, Chaos draws on a uh, little that, bit that, less that, than that 10 books. That's fair. I mean, that's fair. But I, I think that the, the fact that that is, it, it's about... Aldari is four books. It, you know? it's, it's about the combination of rules and being... Now, that is, I, I think I think you're right. The fact that the soup aspect is um, is being able to com- to stack those rules. But I think that the strength of the individual rules of the orc factions themselves yes, make up for that. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and unfortunately, at a at a at a level that you don't see necessarily in Necrons, you don't see it necessarily in Tyranids. Um, you know, you don't you don't see it even in really in Tau. You know, you don't see that strength. I feel like orcs are are balanced well from a, from not just internal balance because actually. You know, there's a couple clear winners uh, from the factions within orcs, but to be honest with you, there's very few that are on. In fact, I would say none of them are unplayable. All of them uh, have play. 
Uh, no. Yeah, and you'll see, you'll see, like I've been running three battalions for orcs. Of course, yeah. Uh, and and those battalions typically have their own cultures. Yes, yeah. For me, I'm still stuck on Evil Sons Bad Moons personally. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, there's an argument for Death Skulls. I've been and, sprinkling in Death Skulls. Like, that third battalion is Death Skulls. Yeah, and there's an argument. There's an argument for Goths. There's an argument for you know, like True. I know the fun list that I want to play, which is two big, beautiful, gargantuan Squigoths. Well, That's gonna be. That's going to be a snake bite. Attachment. I got asked. I've last got a buddy year. who's running a crazy good, and who knows? We might be talking about this at a later date, but a crazy good freebooters list. Oh, so, I, so I, like I want to hear about that. Why? Well, I'm not going to spill those beans just yet. Well, fair enough. I mean, people, lists will be published even before the event anyway. But I got I got asked money. last year, what do you predict is going to win the event? And I and I legitimately thought chaos was going to win. Okay. Uh, the the LVO last year, I thought that it had enough tools to combat the the uh the Yanari threat or whatever. Turns out I was wrong. Yeah, I mean, coming, I mean, Chaos wasn't a bad bet. And like a lot of the Euros were probably feeling like where all the Hive Tyrants at the time um, and, you know, Dark Reapers were already a bogeyman in North America, but not necessarily Shining Spears. And coming into it, Shining Spears were being murmured about, I think. Uh, my my memory is terrible, but nonetheless, uh, I do feel like the narrative was that that was definitely the Eldari coming out party. Um, I, I don't know if you remember, but the internet panned uh, the craft the the uh, the Asurani Craft World Eldar book when it first dropped. No, uh, I, I agree, and that wasn't that much yep. that wasn't that much in advance of the last LVO. It's amazing how fast Eighth Edition has happened. Uh, <laughs> but like this time last year, you know, Craft World Eldar was two months old. I think November it, or maybe late October it dropped. Um, and Custodius was released for the first time. That, that's a good. That's a very good point. Uh, but it, I thought that the chaos. I mean, look, what I'm saying is I was wrong. That's really where I'm going with that. Uh, but but I think the orcs are a real good contender to take this event. I think if 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 I didn't know how seriously orcs were being taken by high caliber players, then I think maybe I'd be wish listening a bit or like, uh, well, well, let's talk hoping for that. the best with orcs. Um, but I, I, I have to agree with you. I think, I think the, the, there are some top players who think orcs are good enough, which to me says too, that the players who are going to play orcs anyway, will have a better shot. Yeah. I mean, I, I think a rising tide, you know, the analogy of the rising tide lifts all boats, you know, whatever, but let's talk about that for a little bit. So, okay. Sure. Um, so that the orcs, strong so people can prepare for them but i think that the orcs have some things going for them and i'm not saying this because i'm i've built an orc army but the orcs have some things that you cannot stop them from doing outside of vect you know the uh, the agents of vect that's, so, that's yeah that's basically the only thing that stops them from doing things that Such are as somewhat, well mob up for instance well i don't know you can stop mob up you can definitely stop mob you up you can't only if you go first. You got to go first. Yes, you do. So and it, your opponent has to set up in a way that allows you to stop on And up. then but you have to prevent them from uh, successfully, I guess, saving with the Grot Shields. I mean, there, there's a lot that can go. There's a lot that can go against you. You have to climb uphill to sure. prevent some of the orc stuff from happening, such as um, Teleporta and the jump. The jump happens pretty much outside of anyone's deny range because it happens in turn one. We talked about this in previous episodes, so I, I don't necessarily want to re retill that ground yeah. or whatever. But I'm saying that the orcs have a lot going for them that makes them very difficult for the for the 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 average. I don't. This is tough because I don't want to say average player, typical player, or whatever. But you need a certain army in a certain situation to affect what they can do to 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 uh, dilute what they can do turn one and turn two. I think one of the most important things is the ability to you know buy yourself some real estate. Yeah, to to get yourself some room on the table and stop the orcs from being on top of you very quickly. And a good good orc player probably isn't going to be on top of you in turn one anyway, um, you know, because that's going to depend on an eight inch charge unless they can do it safely from behind ruins or whatever. But in most cases, there's no real need for an army that's got the strength of Luda shooting to really go for broke on the first turn unless you're me and an idiot. Well, um, you say that, but I'm talking about like you could have your Luda threat and you could have three squads. But now look, we're talking about orcs, and I, look, yeah, we're doing know, it again. You we're doing it, it again. You know, but look, I want to talk about it within the context. Context. We're talking about in, co- in context of what's going to win the LVO. Sure. And uh, I think orcs have a strong shot because you can take three squads of boys without comp and two squads of Ludas without compromising anything else in the list. You know, just to just to put it put a ribbon on it a little bit, you know, my list 
I, I'm playing with my last 500 points. Basically, every day, every time I wake up, it's a different 500 points. And this was stressing me out for a while. And at this point, I'm thinking to myself, I think, you know, first of all, there's my skill cap, which is real. But also, <laughs> I, I can pick those 500 points. I don't know if it necessarily matters. That, I think that's actually are so- very true. Is like what we're talking about is like my list. I have mega knobs in my list. Sure, great that's, choice. That's 200 points of freebies that I could do whatever I want with because I don't. I don't really care what happens with those points. Yeah, uh, you know that that's great. You know, I've 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 had Garkonauts in that spot. I've had um, a, you know the Relic Shock Attack Gun. By the way, great choice. I've, I I should really. I've talked a lot of smack about the. Uh, uh, shock attack gun uh, on an episode I wasn't here for you double back it was when Vigilus came out and you were talking about oh there's a relic version so the shock attack gun is good probably is good it's still yeah, very it swingy 2d6 it's a bit, basically, though look basically it's a lottery ticket for like hilarious amounts of damage that's what it is you've got but it's 80 points to, to buy your lottery ticket and uh, it ain't bad it ain't bad and also it's a lottery ticket that can shoot twice so we're picking this as the odds on favorite to win the event is orcs right so what do you I mean, what do you do with it how do you get them to burn their 18 command points points in inefficiently how do you force them to do that mm-hmm. I, I don't, i'm not sure i know the answer well you gotta give you gotta give the looters a, basically i mean if you give if you give the looters something to shoot for the first two or three turns they're gonna run out of command points real fast so i don't know if there's an intelligent way to use that to your I advantage think you gotta force morale checks i think you got, I, I think you have to force morale checks try to force morale checks and i think you've got to force them to try to teleport a lot of things to attrition those command points yeah well yeah okay so that's that's just like that's list building phase so um are you going to force the orcs into into reserves to start with i think that's good i think one thing too i just want to bring this back a little bit so um last year i had the uh, the sort of I, I would call it a privilege be one of the first people to really parse the um the bcp uh, best Coast pairings data mm-hmm. and so when index 40k started so when eighth edition first kicked off orcs were seven to eight percent of the meta okay so that's that's basically and to me eighth edition starting was a really good and i don't know if it's true but it, it felt like eighth edition right when it kicked off was a really good snapshot of what if everyone was playing what they really in their heart of hearts wanted to play that's what they were playing the start sure of the day. yeah i mean that, that's so, fair because things things that things became viable that were never viable in seven and beyond and beyond whether or not they actually were viable that that came to light later but at the beginning there was hope right <laughs> so fair you know that i and at that moment seven eight percent of the meta was orcs i and now we're seeing if you go to 40k stats.com i'm gonna plug those guys i don't care they're amazing um, I agree. It's, they're it's they're tracking. They're, they're tracking um, basically all the all the relevant tournament stats from every major GT that comes at a very you know, granular level. Uh, if you look at the stats from there, the meta since the Orc Codex is starting to creep back up to seven eight percent orcs. That's of the field. Now seven eight percent is half, you know, of of less than half of what uh, Imperial Knights were at their peak. Um, you know, it's less than half of what Eldari was at, at its peak. Oh, so when we're, when we're when we're talking about orcs, honestly, it, they're going to be an edge case. I, I I might be again. This is a, this is me talking out of my butt a little bit, but I do, I do not agree with an edge case. But but I, go ahead. I think I think you're you're still you, you know you're still going to be much more likely to run into chaos. You're going to be much more like, likely to run into Eldar. You're going to be much more likely to run into um, chaos and Eldar Imperium. Sorry, <laughs> you know like your your uh, your your um, uh, guard uh, plus knights plus whatever custodies. Mm-hmm. No, you know, you, we're talking about or you ha- you have to be able to deal with Castellan. Castellans are going to be the the go to. Yeah. Like I mean, oh. the, stan- the standard boogeymen are still yeah. out there, and yep. you probably could bet heavily that you're just not going to run into orcs. Now, things that work against orcs also work against you know lots of cultists. See, see, okay, look, I agree with you, but I I believe that if you're truly trying to win any tournament that you plan on facing you, your skill needs to get you through round one through three your list needs to get you through four and five now i know we're talking we've about talked about this tournament. before and i think the exact opposite no i look man i'm i'm willing to debate it uh but i think that you bing, really bing, bing. Yeah. go ahead but but well, what i'm saying is i think that your list has to prepare you for what you're going to face in your most challenging rounds. And those most challenging rounds are guaranteed to be the the later part of the tournament. For me, I think 
like, uh, you know, I'm praying no whammies, no whammies, no whammies when I'm coming into a tournament because I want someone who has lost in the list building phase in my first round. Fair. I'm sorry. I do. I well, do. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what I'm talking about. Like you, you can get by. So my list will win round one. My list might win round two. My list is not winning round three. Skill, skill has happened, has definitely come into to become a factor by the time you're in round three. And then once you're in round four, you're actually playing like people who are in it to win it, the possible, uh, you know, winners of a tournament. But like, your list can carry you for one or two rounds. And then, you know, if you're really lucky, if you're really super lucky, that list, you know, and you get the right matchups and whatever, you know, that list can carry you almost to the end. Uh, but eventually it is skill that, that, that wins you the tournament. Not, not what, I mean, you need, the table stakes are an efficient list. That is table stakes. Obviously you cannot get to the later rounds without a, without a good list. But once, once you have a good list versus a good list, then it's skill. I don't want to make it sound like I'm debating it at all. I agree with that, but I think that you need, I not man this is what all the networks do they got like a you know left right you know well, well, pro well, con well, where no, I will we disagree with here, Paul let's it, go is that your your Call list my mother your list has to have the tricks that that foil that like we're talking about that 500 450 500 points or whatever that I'm taking mega knobs you're taking I don't know truck boys I don't know what you're doing over up there in Canada but <laughs> Yesterday it was the Mega Knobs. Tomorrow, you know, now that you've put it in my head, maybe it's a truck. But actually, <laughs> literally right now, it's a truck with tank buses in it. <laughs> I'm in your head, dude. No, it's, right. honestly, I've been I've been thinking a lot about tank buses in a truck. <laughs> I, I, I've been doing this a long time, but what I'm saying is that's what you might need to to overcome those final rounds, and so you need to be thinking about it. Like, what 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 am I going to be playing in round five? Yeah, but yeah, but and by the way, if you want to have a look at what you might be playing in round four five, forty kstats.com. Hate to do this again, but <laughs> you, no, it's, it's cool. No, they, they they're doing they're doing good work over there. The reason why I bring it up, so this is actually something that I've like I personally have coined. Something a concept known as T whip. So uh, tournaments in winning positions. So it's the percentage of uh, a particular faction that get to four and zero essentially. So if you want to go and look and see what what factions might you actually be running into, because say orcs are seven percent of the field overall at the start of the tournament, they might be they, you know they, they might be fifty percent yeah, of, of the fourth round. Yeah. You know they might be yeah exactly like that's probably what that's what Yunari are. You know, that's what Imperial Knights are. Yep. You know, like those guys are wildly overrepresented in in the undefeated category going into round five. So, you know, those those are the guys who are actually in position to win. The, they will be overrepresented. So that'll be very interesting to see how do orcs actually uh, filter out. How many orcs are able to go? Well, for the for the LBO five and zero, actually be in a position to make it to the the top eight, win that sixth game, get to the top eight. Actually, sixth, maybe seventh game, get to the top eight. That and that is a very different picture. Nonetheless, I would suggest that orcs are going to be a very small percentage of that group that are 5 and 0. Okay. Um, Why do you think that? Do you think it's because of the the um the hurdles that are getting an org army on the table? That's a big deal. So um so yeah, first of all just just army selection. Same uh, second of all, I think it's the same reason Tyranids didn't win the LBO last year. The diehards who are playing Tyranids anyway who have the models, they're not necessarily elite tournament players. I mean that's just that's just fact, right? Like book the, the book and the list can only carry you so far. And end of story. Uh, like you, you run into like I don't know. I got my butt whooped playing in Europe. I've I've I have lost Mr. Murphy to some very good players. <laughs> and I'll tell you that there is a. There, it I like to like count I, myself among that. Uh, I, that don't, I didn't. I, I think alumni. I, well, I think we're one in one, but nonetheless, the game we played down here in the basement. Games in the basement don't count. Do they don't count. Oh, they don't shit. count. It's oh, all shit. it's all testing. It's all just. <laughs> whatever <laughs> at any rate so i've lost to some very very good players and i'll tell you that like it's not like i was running a fluff list like yes i mean i've I ragged on my list for etc specifically but it's, it wasn't a cupcake list by any means no you you had some uh very research you had you had grounding for what you picked i i list. thought i thought very hard i had a team of guys behind me who also thought very hard about it, it was not it was not a half-assed effort um despite the result right so like <laughs> and <laughs> and and that's what i'm talking about so like despite best intentions orcs just may not be particularly well represented at the at the final tables because they just might not have the skill to get there um, however, there are good players who have been attracted to or maybe returning to orcs who might be able to take them to the end however I would say don't I think I think you're seeing in a lot of places, especially in some of the recent tournaments, you're seeing a lot of lists starting to skew quite visibly towards being anti 
you know, horde things that might take on. We orcs. talked about Dark Eldar Shredders. <laughs> Dark Eldar. I have, honestly, I haven't seen the Dark Eldar Shredder in the well, meta yet. Maybe you, it'll you, appear. You can take that uh, that um, that craft world, not craft world, the Dark Eldar trait that allows you to increase the range by six inches, so you can fire those shredders. Sure, Shred- really shredders might be good. D6. Maybe next time we play in the basement, you can whip out some shredders. Well, it's D six shots. They reroll wounds against infantry. Could be one, could be six. You never know. Well, it's when a D6. You, if you go to the look, I, I actually hesitate to recommend index choices, but the Trueborn in the index can still take four, four shredders. Uh, the the the, the, the uh, I guess um, I actually I've, I've kind of lost my train of thought. But nonetheless, I think I think the point I was trying to make is that you know you just you don't you don't know if orcs are really going to live up to those expectations. That's all I'm trying to say. And I think the things that are proven that you know when you're going into an event like like the LVO it's, it's kind of like uh, there was a play uh, in the in the in the Saints Eagles game recently where the Saints brought on uh, their backup quarterback for a play to run sort of a wildcat thing, and it made me think of we're when talking about American football here, folks. We're talking about American football, which Canadians love, this Canadian especially. So they they brought in they brought in their backup quarterback, and they did the shotgun thing, it's sort of a wildcat formation. But you took Drew Brees off the field, man. You know, so you're taking <laughs> your best player. You know, and that's always the conundrum. You're taking the your your, your best player off the field to maybe go with this like home run hitter. And that's to me the same thing as every time a new book drops. So when the good players look at that new book, they look at it and say, well, I already have Drew Brees. I've got my Drukari list. I've got my Castellan slash whatever Imperium list. Why would I bench Drew Brees and bring on this other, this other team and, or this other player? Um, and you know, some of those best players have said, you know what, actually, that's Mike Vick, or sorry, that might be a bad example these days. You know, that's <laughs> that's a uh, you know that's that's an elite quarterback. That's a uh, Baker Mayfield on the bench. You know, that's somebody who I can I can pull up and I can play. And you know, maybe that's what orcs are. They're the new bad. But you're betting. You're making a big bet when you're going away from tried and true to something like orcs. Oh man, I I don't know. I I think that. Um... I think you need to bank on it. I think you need to bank on anti horde. And if you do bank, if you do pack some, you know, whatever. I mean, grow, growing up, I used to always keep a heavy flamer in my list. So if you have something in your, in your army that can deal, if you can find that sweet spot of what can deal with infantry, mass bodies, hey man. And, and Castellans. I was, I was watching a stream recently where three vultures. So why are you bringing three vultures, pal? I'm bringing three vultures because you think you're running into 90 boys. I saw three vultures kill 11 boys. For the record, it's 120 shots, folks. I'm not a Vulture fan. It does get strafing run, though. So that <laughs> no. sounds like some bad luck on the Vulture part. There's some variants. Let's talk about the no. variants for a second. And not not to derail us into a, into a topic, but last week, Mike brought up the fact that the 10% odds sometimes converts. Hell yeah. So this is the argument, this is the argument for the shock attack gun. <laughs> <laughs> the really? shock attack gun is way more performer than, than 10%. You've got to, you've got to roll your strength and, you see, how many, how many things do we got to roll? We got to roll our strength and our, and our, um, amount of shots. All right, you might be right, though. All right, so that's two random rolls every time you roll. And then and, hit on fives. And it's hit on fives. So, okay. and let's think that's about that. That's a bad that. example. Let's not talk about the shock attack gun. Yeah, you're right. Let, you're right. Let's We're talk doing about it again. We're the doing fact it again. That, that, that the 10% sometimes happens. Yes. Um, and if you're on the receiving end of that Which 10%. Percent, shock attack on his no, okay, okay. <laughs> well if you're on the receiving end of that 10 percent, it's terrible yeah uh, so how do you avoid being just in that 10 percent situation i think that's what the list i think that happens in the list building phase and that goes that goes back to what i was talking about as to how do you prepare yourself for the fifth and sixth rounds in, in a tournament like this to me though like if you're looking for if, I mean, if you're the kind of player who can anticipate a 10% scenario and and actually position yourself mm-hmm. just in case that might happen. Mm-hmm. And by the way, in, in watching some of the games that I've been watching lately on on various streams, top players do think this way. If if the worst yep. case scenario happens, and actually my, uh, Mr. Brandt, Mike, Mike was talking about this, which which was playing as if the absolute worst things were going to happen. And so if you if you position yourself and set yourself up in in a way that is a worst case scenario, then, you know, if that does happen, you're not caught out in the wind. I think the simplest version of this that most players would be able to to really easily apply in their games is always deploy as if you're going second or always deploy as if you're going, you know, the turn that you think is less favorable for you. So if you want to go second, 
deploys if you're going first, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so like, I think that's, the, but, but to be able to think about that 10% situation, like honestly, man, like I'm a level player and I, I don't want to disappoint the audience here, but I'm the level player who's, you know, just hopefully moving, you know, my models around accurately and not screwing up my rules too badly <laughs> and, you know, shooting the right things at the right time. And hopefully miracles happen and I get wins, you know, but like really top players, people who are threatening the podium of things like the LVO, a 700, 800 player tournament. Um, these guys are able to think like, you know, what might happen? Or they practice enough to be able to see what might happen uh, in a 10% scenario. Um, you, I, I mean, you might be there. I don't know, Paul. You might be there. But I, I don't necessarily, if, I, if I'm ready for that. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually more of a player who could say, I'm going to play for the 80% scenario and just hope that that's what happens. And hope that I hit enough 80% scenarios that, you know, it carries me. That, that's and, fair. And it's, you know what? That attitude has done me well in the past. Not at the EGC, but, you know. <laughs> Oh, man. A lot. <laughs> in some but tournaments, I, I was put, I was putting myself in the ten percent scenario uh, every time. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, L all right. L let's let's pause this. Next week, we'll talk about how to control the momentum of a game. You know, uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll just uh, take notes. <laughs> well, I mean, I think this is very important, especially in an ITC mission format, is is to how to continue to score a lot of points. I mean, I, I hate to say it. I mean, the guy who's going to win this game is going to guy who gets the most hundred yards or whatever. Yeah, the, the person who wins is the one who scores the most points. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't mean it that way, but, uh, but the, the how to really, uh, take control of the momentum of a game. That's what we're going to talk about next week. But I think that's real. Like if, if you go, if you go two turns without, without, um, you know, scoring more or, uh, or holding more, you know, you're in a hole and there's a finite amount of points in an ITC game uh, that you could potentially yeah. pick up. You know, this if you're playing like, if you're playing ETC, there is um, there's a variable amount of points that you pick up depending on maelstrom. It's happened. going to be a complicated topic because we're going yeah. to talk about like time management. We're going to we're going to talk yep. about um, uh, when to recognize that you've got to do some more work. I mean, it's, it's it's going to be a complicated topic. But I want to jump right into the finishing move segment for this week, and this I want to talk about some rust. Uh, last week we talked about mud and the texture and the depth of mud, uh, but I found. A really cool technique that allows you to apply some pretty realistic rust with almost no skill at all. Ooh. Well, okay. I, I, I have, I have one recommended by a Games Workshop, so I want to hear what you got. Well, this is also, this is something endorsed by Games Workshop as well, uh, which you can see on their videos, but I showed you some pictures of this, which is Scrag Brown. Oh, that, okay. This color is what I would consider old rust. Uh, if you're, if you want to do like new rust, fresh rust, you want to go with a brighter orange, such as like a Troll Slayer or the Rizza Rust. So with Scrag Brown, you can use Lamia Medium to really thin it down, or which is what the suggested thing is, because Lamia Medium doesn't change uh, the texture or the sheen of the paint or whatever. You can also use just water. If you use Scrag Brown and, and really get it to a watery consistency and then paint it into the recesses, you can get a really good old rust effect. This is going to give you a ruddy brown rust effect. It takes almost no skill at all. It's all technique. It is just using your, you want to do a recess wash. I get a little uh, grief sometimes for calling it a recess wash. You want to paint into the crevices of the figure. It's like a, like a reverse highlight. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, so, but it, again, it's, there's, it's pretty effortless. Once you get to, to that, uh, that consistency of the paint and you do, you want it, you want to make it on your palette. Uh, if it's starting to kind of separate into its own, um, little pools, like if, if you have like a, 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 when you're, when you're thinning down the paint and it starts to separate and when it starts to get in that kind of like almost looking like two or three different little lakes when you're running it together that you've gone a little bit too far. If you do it right before that, or even with that, you could even do it as long as it's just at that level. You can paint it just in the crevices, and you're going to get a really kind of gritty, texturally um, apparent look to what is what will look like old rust. If you want a newer rust or a fresher rust, you want to go with a brighter orange. You can do it with Troll Slayer, or you can do it with the Rizza. Uh, but if you want uh, the old, really gritty, ancient technology type look, it's like it's like a rust on a uh, on an item that's in use, so yeah. like all the all the all the all the rust that's actually on clinging to the like higher edges of the of the of the piece, 
that's going to be worn off because people are actually handling it or moving it around, and so you only get the the, the rust and the recesses. That's exactly right, and I'm not I'm not sure if, if the Scrag Brown intentionally has something in it, but it, it it's got that kind of um, ancient uh, patina to the color, like naturally. So you do nothing to it; you just simply use the Scrag Brown and a little Lamia Medium or water, and you can get it right in the crevices, and it's going to look like old rust. Yeah, can you back me up on that, Val? I'm backing you up as we speak well I, I also post pictures of this stuff uh, i try not to endorse anything that i that i don't use and i post pictures of my uh, my efforts on twitter and you can find me at warmaster underscore tpm and i've got some pictures of what is is going to be my adepticon team tournament army uh that are coming up and we're we're using a kind of a weathered look and i wanted to get i mean this this was lead belcher Right out of the pot, some Agrax Earth Shade to, to to give it a, a slight uh, tint to it, and then going in with that uh, that Scrag Brown with just a little bit of thinning into the crevices, and it looks it looks like a ten thousand year old piece of technology, if you ask me. <laughs> it looks great. I you've been you've been sharing a lot of those uh, with me, not just um, not just that technique too, but you had another one as well that I think looks fantastic. The, that's the chipping fluid. We can, we can talk about it the next week, which is uh, oh. oh, let me let me tell you. Go I have to leave you guys on a cliffhanger on the Well, chicken. okay. Let me tell you the the terror, the uh <laughs> the gut check moment when you're putting a weathered stripe onto what is otherwise a pretty much finished tank. Like you, you, <laughs> well, that's all it. weathering though. But you, you guys you, you've touched on this in the past in finishing moves like the weathering step is, oh man, this this model looks great. You gotta push it past now, where you want, right? Now, so now I'm gonna, now I'm gonna mess it up in an artistic way, you know. <laughs> but see, I've gone, I've gone, I tried to go past that with, I've got the tank where I want, I've got it, I've got it sat and varnished, like it's it's ready for. I'm about to put some mud on the tracks, but like, oh what, you know what? This side of the tank, this side of the Bane Blade chassis looks pretty uniform and monochrome, and I want to put something on there that makes it pop. I'm going to put a white stripe on this thing. Love the white stripes. And so how do I, yeah, little Seven Nation Army or whatever, like, <laughs> how do I put this stripe on here that looks like it wasn't an afterthought? So that's that's a good topic for next week. You, I can hear the audience asking for more. And that is, uh, no, but honestly. It's no, stressful. It's, it's, it's I mean, look, as someone who's not, I'm not an artist, man. Like, I'm not an artist. But uh, but I think I can get some effects through techniques, and that's what this finishy move stuff is all about. It's about what you, what you can do for 10 minutes that's going to make your, your your army uh, noticeable from three, four, or five feet away. Can I do the talent in a bottle version of everything you've just described? Yes. So the first one is Escaping Me. <laughs> it's a wash. It's got like a grit in it. It's a Games Workshop product. Come on, Paul. You know Typhus Corrosion. Typhus Corrosion. Typhus being a character in the Warhammer 40,000 universe. Uh, Typhus Corrosion. And then you let that dry. And it's got like a bunch of goobers in it. A lot, a lot of like um, microbeads or I don't even know what the heck's in it. Um, <laughs> it and then texture. It's not microbeads. It's microbeads. Uh, okay. And then you I have no idea. And then you uh, dry brush that with Rizza Rust. Not the Jizza Rust. Just the Rizza Rust. <laughs> and it's fantastic. Like so, a lot of my orc weapons are exactly that combination, and to me, it looks brilliant. But Paul's right. What it is is a fresh rust. So it's like a something that is a, like a lump of iron. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Like something cast iron that you have left in the rain, and and then you've picked it up for the first time before any of that the high parts of that rust have have wiped off of it. That's the effect that you're getting. But like my mech guns are that. Uh, all the grot weapons I have are that. Um, so anything like sort of that I think a, like a grot or like a low level orc has has handled, that's the type of uh, rust effect I have on on my weapons. So I think it's a really really fantastic and super easy to do. And our good friends at the Games Workshop Corporation endorse your uh, use of it. Well, I think you got to be deliberate when you apply this kind of stuff as as to what the what the end look you want to go for is. And and if you've got something that that bright orange contrasts well with, who cares what the science is? Yeah. Uh, who cares what is really happening with that rust? If that bright orange looks good, then that's what you use. Yeah. I mean, it looks good, and I love the texture of it too. And actually, that type of corrosion idea could probably work with a uh, you know some other other techniques, not just just, not just doing that orange rust on it because it's got that texture which can catch um, you know a dry brush or whatever that you're doing. We're giving away too much. People got to turn in tune in next week. Oh, Paul, come on! They're gonna they're gonna tune in next week for, for this kind of content rust, for more rust talk. We've already talked about mud. We got rust. Maybe uh, 
I don't even know. Well, Where we got to talk go? about how to put a stripe on some that are that already looks all right. <laughs> how to mask off something? Yeah, that's it. That's it, man. We'll talk about it. Uh, right. Val, th- thanks for joining us, man. Uh, you're going to be competing at the LVO here in a couple of weeks, and that's that's why we're, our our coverage is continuing to focus on the road to LVO. Yeah, uh, going to be delivering. I'm going to be delivering some some stories. From the event, uh, gonna be trying to, to do, go live and record some stuff for YouTube as, as, uh, uh, as the story unfolds from the LVO as we, as we build towards the winner of that event. It's gonna be an absolute massive event. Uh, please tune in. We're, uh, next week we'll talk about how to gain control of the momentum of a game. Maybe when to also when to recognize when you're losing it. <laughs> yeah. You might, you might benefit from that. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, usually the end of my deployment phase. That's usually when I, when, <laughs> when, when reality sinks in. Uh, uh, and then how not to screw up an otherwise cool paint job. That's what, that's what we're going to talk about next week. <laughs> this is, you know what? I'm not going to be on the show. I'm just going to, I'm just going to be at home listening. <laughs> well, man, thanks, uh, thanks for joining me. We'll talk to you next week. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Paul. You have a good night. See ya. Corner.